The Holy Gospel according to Mark as found in the first chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just, when, just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed and kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And once his fame began to spread through the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, I would say that Paul is sounding a little cranky in our reading from Corinthians. <laughs> but hey, what else is new? It seems like Paul is always going on about something in his letters. He's a lot like Luther in that way, always pointing out the error of other people's ways. Or I guess maybe Luther is a lot like Paul, since Paul did come first. But either way, they both really love a good argument. So Paul is arguing with the church at Corinth, a group that had enough issues to fill two large letters. <coughs> Excuse me. This time, Paul is concerned over what the Corinthians are eating, specifically eating meat that has been sacrificed in a temple dedicated to an idol. Now, I know this sounds strange to us. We can't imagine eating food that has been part of a ritual in a pagan religion. But things were very different at the time Paul was writing this letter. Corinth was a large city for its day, populated mostly by tradespeople, artisans, and merchants, not farmers and herders. Unlike many of the small towns and communities of Israel, these people didn't keep animals on their property or in their homes for milk and meat. What this meant was that if you wanted to eat meat, you had to buy it somewhere. The various pagan temples in the city were set up so that after an animal was sacrificed to whatever god or goddess was worshipped there, it was taken out the back door or there was a meat market attached to the back of the temple building. This is where those who could afford meat came to shop. Now, in many of the cult religions of Corinth, eating this meat had some sort of significance. In some cases, it was simply the idea of communion with the god or goddess. Not a holy communion, body of Christ sort of communion, but the belief that you were having a meal with the god because you were eating the same food as the god. In other cults, however, eating the same meat that had been offered in a ritual sacrifice was supposed to give you some of the special powers of that God. You were imbued with strength or wisdom or fertility. There were all sorts of possibilities. So why is this a problem for Christians? If you are a follower of Christ, of the one true God, this time with a capital G, you know that these so-called gods, gods are fake, nothing more than a contrivance of human imagination. Why does it matter if you eat meat that has been used in one of their rituals? Jesus came to set people free from the burden of the law, so it makes sense to say we eat it and we see no problem because we don't believe in idols anyway. Why is Paul chastising the Corinthians for having healthy appetites as long as they can afford to buy what they want? Well, Paul's concern is for the weak. He doesn't think of them as weak necessarily, but he uses that language because it's probably the word the Corinthians leaders used in their letters to him. Many of the Christians in Corinth at this time were recent converts from idol worship and really uncomfortable eating the only meat that was available to them. They have fresh memories of the significance of eating this food, the special powers, the deeper level of relationship with this God, with the gods, that this meal is supposed to bring about.
they're struggling with their faith. But the response of the Christian leadership in Corinth is basically, well, if it's a problem for you, don't do it. It isn't the problem for us, so we're going to keep on eating what we want. And this is where Paul really gets cranky. Yes, says Paul, Christ has set us free. But this freedom belongs within a context of responsibility, and especially of love. Knowledge and insight for Paul are always relational. People are always the focus. Paul's constant priority is, what does this mean for my relationship with God and with others? Because his relationship with God cannot be separated from his relationship with others. The problem at Corinth isn't that those who were eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols are wrong. The problem is that there's always more to consider than being right. Paul is not happy with the leadership's we're right and the heck with you attitude because what he wants is for relationships to be right. Relationship matters the most. In today's reading, we heard the English words know and known and knowledge several times. Paul is challenging cultural ideas about knowledge and its proper place in life. In Corinth, there are people who are puffed up with their knowledge about God. Knowledge as information can be addictive, and Paul realizes that some of the Corinthians have forsaken everything else in pursuit of it. This is why he speaks of being known by God. It is more valuable, he says, to be known by God than to know about God. These people whom the others call weak are not simply going to turn around and make the rational jump into freedom. They're on a journey, struggling to live into their freedom. Paul could have chosen to write something that would set the record straight for these so-called weak Christians, but instead he chooses love. To be with them means to take their situation into account. It's not a matter of just being right, but of doing the right thing, the caring thing for these brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul's assessment is that this will mean abstaining where it would create problems for them. Now, love does have to be informed. The choice for love doesn't mean that we automatically stop doing anything that might cause offense to another person. We are often called to take a stand that goes against culture, even against other Christians. But our actions must be motivated by love. Throughout this first letter to the Corinthians, Paul addresses the issues faced in Corinth from the standpoint of acting in love. The church, he says, is filled with jealousy and quarreling. Many members are arrogant. There are divisions in worship and in the Lord's Supper and disputes over spiritual gifts, all of which are not showing the love of God to, in people's lives to those around them. But in chapter 13, Paul really sums up this point. I won't read the whole chapter, but Paul writes in part, if I speak in tongues of mortals and of angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. Thank you.